Improving Alpha Innovation in Investing, ESG and Technology with Michael Oliver Weinberg in partnership with Vidrio Financial is being sponsored by Alternatives Watch, providing a 360-degree view of investor mandate activity across alternative investments. TheFundMarketer.com, a comprehensive directory of products, services, and information for asset management, sales, and marketing professionals. And PEVC Tech, a community for family offices, private equity funds, lenders, and VCs using AI and analytics to generate alpha. Vidrio Financial is a premier data management provider, shouldering the responsibility for your data from collection to extraction, transformation, and enrichment. Vidrio monitors over 2,000 diverse funds, processing millions of data points each month. Discover how Vidrio empowers your institutional portfolio data by combining advanced AI and human expertise to yield comprehensive analytics on performance, cash flow, risk, valuation, and more. All delivered seamlessly through Vidrio's data management hub. Save your investment team valuable operational time, providing actionable insights like never before. Explore more at vidrio.com. Hi, this is Michael Oliver Weinberg. We would like to welcome everyone to the Improving Alpha Innovation and Investing ESG and Technology podcast series. Today, Chris Wiggins, fellow Columbia University professor, though in Chris's case at the School of Engineering in the Data Science Institute. As importantly, Chris is chief data scientist at the New York Times. So listeners have a high level sense of our roadmap for today. We will start with some background, then discuss technology. Investors and business leaders should be able to extract a great deal of value from Chris's insight. On that note, welcome, Chris. Thanks very much for having me. Our pleasure. Let's start briefly with your career revolution, how you got to where you are today. Like most people who've been working in data science for more than a decade, I was not trained in data science, right? There weren't a bunch of programs in data science years ago when I started working on trying to make sense of the world through data. So my background in a previous millennium was in theoretical physics. And I started working in physics, you know, in the early 90s. And in particular, I was interested in how physics could be used to understand biology, which is a pretty complex environment. And a funny thing happened to biology in the 90s. It became a data science, meaning once people started sequencing freely living organisms in the 90s, suddenly biologists had to figure out how do we comport organisms that we've understood for 100 years with abundant data sets, and there's sort of no fundamental mathematical model to compare the two. So that was an exciting time, and as I and other statistical physicists started thinking about how to think about biology statistically, I started realizing that a lot of the tools from machine learning could be really useful. So I would say about 20 years ago, my research pivoted from thinking like a physicist about complex systems in biology to thinking like a machine learner about complex systems in biology. And a after doing that for a while, I started finding out more about where machine learning came from and ways that it had been applied. And most faculty take a sabbatical from university at some point to go learn new stuff. And in my case, I took a sabbatical to the New York Times and started working with them and after one semester off working with them where I was really actually writing code, I said to them, well, I got to go back and teach, but why don't we continue working together and I could probably help bring together a, a data science team to prove out the hypothesis that machine learning is useful at the New York Times. And, and that's what we've been doing. And so 20 years ago, you know, we know that machine learning has been around for 75 years since post-World War II, as you know, but what 20 years ago, what, what techniques were you using in machine learning? I mean, supervised learning was already very mature 20 years ago, and also probability, you know, just modeling things and inferring complex structures, modeling structures from data was already pretty mature then. So the work then, a lot of it was problems of separating, you know, this from that. So whether it's like looking at an image and saying, is that a cat face or not a cat face, or um, predicting if a gene is going to go up or go down, a lot of the problems where you try to predict what's going to happen predictive analytics, but supervised learning, a technologist would say, was pretty well mature, certainly 20 years ago. So a lot of my early work was thinking, how can we take biology problems and reframe them as prediction problems? It was already well known 20 years ago that for modeling complex systems, there's a balance or sometimes a tension between models that are extremely predictive and models that are extremely interpretable. And Doing machine learning in science is one of the places where you really see that. Sometimes you have a model that's really good at predicting what's going to happen, but you really have no idea why it does what it does. 
And there's other problems where you want to work with a human being who's a domain expert, and they really want to understand why does the model work that way? What are the important features? So that that was sort of the state of the art 20 years ago. Got it. And then in terms of data science, mm -hmm. what are best practices in data science today? Mm -hmm. So the term, just like AI, you know, the term data science has meant different things in different decades and different communities. The way we use it as the new, at the New York Times for the last more than 10 years has been data science is the craft of trying to apply machine learning to real world problems. And the data science team does that by developing and deploying machine learning models, working in close partnership with domain experts. And the domain expert could be a product person or somebody from marketing, a, a general manager of some line of business, and trying to figure out how to reframe their questions as machine learning tasks execute the machine learning, and then either produce data products or at least produce insights that help people improve their strategy. Usually what we do at, at the Data Science at the New York Times now is develop things that people use. So that could be the recommendation engine or the algorithm that controls the paywall, you know, things that actually change internal processes. And what, what, what lessons have, have you learned over your data science career as it's evolved over the past couple of decades, as you alluded to? Yeah. Well, 20 years is enough time to build up a lot of scar tissue and learn a lot of <laughs> lessons from doing things wrong. I mean, a couple of lessons that I, I think are really useful are, you know, people, ideas, and things in that order that ultimately, if you're going to be collaborating with people in a company, you really need to understand what people want and, you know, what are the real problems that people want solved? I and mean, I think that's somewhat true in academic publishing. Also, you have to understand, like, what are the questions that actually would be useful to your scientific community? And that's hard for technologists because we often focus on the tech, which is to say the thing. And so it's, it's difficult to remember that in the long term, you know, people Id matter, ideas matter more than things matter. Point that's more particular to data science is the eye-popping results that sort of excite everybody in the press around AI, and this has been true for decades, are built on top of a bunch of infrastructure and fundamentals. One lesson learned, and this has been true for a long time, is often a company will hire a data scientist and or now an AI specialist and say, okay, now go do the AI thing. And the company hasn't thought about like, what do they have the fundamentals correct? And the fundamentals here are, are you tracking data? Are the data available? Are they accurate? Have you built out data processing pipelines so that if you want to not build a model once, but you want some change in process, that the data are being refreshed in a way that are available, accurate, performant. And that actually is engineering. Like it's the reason the word engineering is in software engineering. Building some sort of platform you can rely on requires a lot of engineering work. Once you've done that, then you can think about very basic things like, have you done some dashboarding so you have some observability into what's happening? Have you done some basic A-B tests to figure out if you have KPI mindset, meaning have you thought about how running your company well can be quantified in terms of a key performance indicator, and then done some experiments to see if you can move that key, key performance indicator. And then you can really think about, okay, how to put machine learning to work to change process. So I do think there's, there's an opportunity for any company to bring in somebody who's doing AI and data science as provocations without necessarily building out the platform first. But if you really want to change people's process, you need to think about building the platform and then think about doing products, think about how those products are going to change people's process. And that ultimately is going to deliver way more value than just one or two provocations to sort of get the conversation started. Along those lines, one of my theories for some time really and continues to be, so new companies will have an advantage over legacy companies in that if they are built now with a date with technology machine learning data science ground up rather than retrofitting so to speak like more of like sort of what you described that, that can be a challenge they they'll have an advantage i don't know do, does that make sense or not really or do you do you agree disagree i mean i would say they have one advantage but incumbents often have other advantages also so sure i mean what keeps incumbents alive is that they have other advantages as well I, I, honestly i think the best answer to this is found in the innovation report. So 10 years ago, I think roughly 10 years ago this week, an internal team at the New York Times wrote a report on innovation, which internally, we just call it the innovation report. And uh, it takes a real hard look at exactly that challenge. Like how can incumbents not simply be disrupted, right? And so in the, in the classic Clay Christensen sense of disruptors, yeah. disrupting innovators, uh, incumbents rather, 
And they take a real hard look at that. And then they say, okay, well, now let's think about what that says about the New York Times. So the New York Times is, has been in a, a real challenging environment over the last two decades because for the last century, the business model of journalism has been very closely tied to advertising, right? And advertising has totally changed in the last 30 years, say, like the business of advertising. So fortunately for the New York Times, it had sufficient you know, cash and control, as, as Bill Janeway might say, to see the water rising and to slowly turn itself into a fish, which in this case means to transition from a very dominant ad model to a balanced advertising and subscription model to a point now, and, and when I say now, I really mean for like the last decade, dominated revenue by subscriber revenue rather than advertising revenue. So that's that's a real, I mean, that's going to be one for the record books to see how a company that was made in 1851 managed to embrace digital over the last 20 years and change the fundamentals of its business model without without falling apart. Yeah, but I think you're, I think that's exceptional and I think that's super impressive and I think that's, that's the canonical Columbia casework study that, that that worked. But I think they're probably more on balance of those that don't tip the right way. But yeah, well, well done. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And you spoke at that conference at uh, Columbia last week where, yeah. you know, on the disruption of journalism and business AI and democracy and the changes in media. But, you know, based on, you know, your research, it, it seems as you have a reductive view of data science such that it has three components descriptive data sets, predictive models, and prescriptive solutions. Maybe you could touch on that that framework briefly for our listeners. Sure. I, I think those are useful words because you know, they're already words in English. So if, if I go to my partners and say, okay, well, do you want me to do unsupervised, supervised, or reinforcement learning? They, they want to know what I'm talking about. But if I say, okay, are we trying to make a simplified description of the world? Are we trying to predict outcome in the absence of treatment? Or are we trying to figure out what is the optimal treatment that's going to drive your outcome? Those are really three different problems. And so you you really set up things different way, somewhat in terms of the math, but more so in terms of your relationship with partners. And again, this is, I would say, an example of scar tissue where I came to the New York Times from biology, or let's say from science. And in science, you're often trying to understand the world rather than change it, as opposed to in engineering, right? And being in a company or being a doctor or being a robot, right? These are all things where you actually have to interact with the world and make decisions, which is, I have to say, kind of different than just trying to understand how the world works as it does. So when I showed up at the New York Times, the first thing I worked on was, okay, well, can we predict which subscribers are going to cancel? I mean, that's sort of quantitative marketing 101. And, you know, I sort of went to people and say, hey, look at this cool machine learning that I did. And people said, great, but like, I don't necessarily need to know who are the at-risk individuals today. I want to know the risky behaviors and what are the behavior, what are the leading indicators for somebody being at risk to turn? And more importantly than any of that is what am I going to do about it? So again, if you're a business or a doctor or a robot, what you're really interested in is prescriptions. You're interested in figuring out what is the optimal treatment that's going to drive some outcome. And that's a different type of analysis than predictive analytics, right? Predicting what's going to happen in the absence of treatment is a huge body of work in machine learning. It's actually not them sort of the most valuable thing in most companies. Most companies, what's really valuable is you figure out what is the key performance indicator that quantifies success? What are the levers I can pull to improve that key performance indicator? How can I, you know, hook those things together and turn the operation of my company into stochastic optimization? And that's, that's prescription. It's the case where you need to make decisions in an automated way, as opposed to something where you want to predict what's going to happen in the absence of treatment. So that's, I would say, one one lesson learned, which, you know, I, I didn't really need to think about until I actually started talking to people, right? If you're, if you're publishing for other people who are doing supervised learning, which is a prediction rather than prescription, you know, that's that's a coherent literature and it helps us understand things. But if you really want to not understand, not just understand the world, but to change it, you're interested in a different type of, of mathematics and also a different type of relationship between data scientist and, and partner than you are when you're just predicting. Right. You mentioned companies sort of having to have a clear view of when they bring in someone to do data science and, and what their goals are. I do think a lot of legacy companies, well, inherently, right, most company, most successful companies, to your point, they, they have advantages, they're, they're legacy for a reason. They have existing businesses and teams. When they're bringing in a data scientist, what should they be looking for? It really depends on the maturity of the company. So. 
if it's a company that's really hasn't built out any of the infrastructure whatsoever, first they should ask if they really want a data scientist. Maybe if they want as a data engineer or a data analyst. Maybe not the right time to bring in a data scientist. If you bring in somebody who's sort of an AI machine learning engineer, then you should go into it with eyes wide open that what you're doing is you're asking somebody to be like an artist. You know, they're going to do provocations. They're going to change your understanding of the world, but it's not necessarily something that's going to, you know, you're going to hook that up into the pipes. They're going to change your business model. So that's one thing. If you're in a company where you've built out the data infrastructure and you have that sort of bottom layer of what's of the sort of AI hierarchy of needs, to quote a blog post by Monica Rigatti from 2017, if you've built out the fundamentals, then you can start thinking about hiring data analysts and then data scientists to eventually build, develop, and deploy machine learning models that are going to improve things. So I would say the advice really changes for different companies based on their maturity, and particularly their, in, their maturity around data. That's sensible. Let's shift the conversation to machine learning, mm -hmm. um, which you've sort of opened with that you were using 20 years ago. Obviously, with the advent of, of LLMs and GPT-4, it's really it's taking another leap. Yesterday, I was listening to the demos of, you know, 4.0 and the voice one, and uh, it's quite remarkable. I don't know. Did you have a chance to hear that yet? Yeah, I've, I've watched the videos. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, to me, I had thought that would have taken, like, some time to get to in terms of qualitatively. Like, if I think of the Turing test, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to me, that's pretty well passing the, the Turing test. I mean, and... I mean, the implications, I think, are sort of greater and faster than at least I had thought. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts on that are. It's an exciting time. Getting computers to generate language by looking at human language and then statistically subsampling it is old, right? I mean, that's, a, that's an idea from Claude Shannon from 1945. And by 1950 or so, Alan Turing was publishing papers saying, in principle, we could get computers to learn from data. We would just need much, much more memory than we have in 1950, which is true. So I think part of what we've seen is a surprising realization that more is different, to quote a famous paper by the physicist Phil Anderson from 50 years ago, that you know people realized in the last decade that if you want a model to generate language by statistically sampling from previous human language, it can do a, a better and better job the bigger the computer is and the bigger the data set is. And so now we've seen this field of scaling laws, as it's been called for the last five years, where people realize you just make bigger computers and bigger data and train on bigger corpora of texts, and you can get stuff that passes more artificial intelligence tasks, you know, like you can get it to pass the bar exam or something like that. So it's been very exciting in the last couple of years for people to see that progress and market has responded. By that, I mean venture capitalists, universities, major companies, nation states are clearly pouring a lot of money into this problem and seeing results, right? So the, the scaling laws seem to be continuing for now. Eventually, they will probably plateau, right? Most scaling laws eventually hit some limit. At some point, they're going to hit the limit of terms of the, the national GDP spend or the total amount of energy you know, available. They're going to consume all of the data they can train on, and then eventually they're going to start training on synthetic data so that there's more data to work with. We're seeing a, just a, a more is different scaling experience right now. So it's very exciting. And for me, as somebody who's worked for decades on what I now call good old-fashioned machine learning, it's also exciting because all these people are interested in AI, and I can say to them regularly, like, yeah, like, yes, AI is really cool. Have you heard about logistic regression or even like linear programming and all these other ideas that are algorithms. They're not necessarily generating text, but there's lots of ways to put data to work to help you understand the world or to do your job better. Or, and again, whether you're like you're a company or a robot or a doctor, there's, there's all sorts of ways that data can be used to make better decisions um, outside of the thing that's been grab grabbing everybody's attention since like November of 2022. Uh, so for me, it's an exciting time in part because there's just a lot more curiosity about data and, and how data can be used to make sense of the world. I'm with you. I mean, to me, it was a confluence of four factors. And I, I had co-founded a firm called Move37 focused on machine learning and alternative data and investment management. And yeah, I mean, the confluence of record load processing and storage costs, record amounts of data, machine learning working and, and data science. You put those four together and that's the sort of that's facilitated the most recent AI boom, because as, as you alluded to, and we both know, there have been various nuclear winters in AI over the past 70 years. 
in light of G- GPT and LLMs, which are, to your point, again, also getting all the hype now. And yet, again, obviously, as, as you know and alluded to, there's support vector machines. There are plenty of other machine learning techniques that LLMs are getting all the hype. There's still plenty of room for all those other techniques, right? It's just mm-hmm. this is this is the most understandable for most people, right? Well, it's pushing. So AI has always had this problem, which John McCarthy called the AI problem, where some algorithm is able to do something and then people sort of accept it as not shocking and then it becomes no longer AI. It becomes just the thing that people accept. So as this frontier continues to push, what we're really pushing is continually doing a computer, getting a computer to do something that surprises us. And that's by construction, that's transient, right? Because you won't be surprised forever. Eventually you're like, oh, of course, computers can do that. I'm used to that. So this just happens to be the thing that's having its AI moment. We're like, oh, we're surprised that computers can do that too. And eventually we will no longer be surprised by it. That's the, that's the way surprise works. But yes, generating hallucinatory text by taking other text and then statistically subsampling and predicting the next word, it, it's a great idea. Scale it up and it's going to generate results that clearly surprise people right now. Eventually people will not be surprised by it. They're going to extend it different ways. Multimodal is clearly a thing, right? Audio, video, text, images all together. There's plenty of room for that to expand. And separately, there's lots of questions in the world, the answer to which is not generating new random text or images, right? So there's there's still lots of room for optimization and uh, prediction and trying to figure out what is the best treatment from a limited set of treatments. There's still many ways to make sense of the world through data other than generating random text or images that's been trained on other text or images. So yeah, there's, there's lots of innovation ahead of us. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. In terms of LLMs, how do you see them reshaping the media industry, for example? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I mean, the the thing that's easiest for people to understand is the part of media that's people facing, which is the words that the readers are, are reading, right? It's, it's a B2C industry and it's consumers are there and, the, and they're experiencing the, the front end of it, which is the words they're reading. That said, what people are generally paying for is words that they're really sure that they're accurate, which means that statistically sampled generated words are not necessarily what people are going to pay for in the future. That said, there's, there's plenty of other things where content marketing it doesn't necessarily need to be perfectly accurate. And so content marketing might be a field where generating stuff is contributing. But I think as you move away from the front end towards the back end, there's all sorts of opportunities for efficiency of people. So if we move away from the front end towards the back end, every company is a software company and generating software is much easier if you're leveraging AI. I mean, that's that's sort of what the, the Copilot product has shown. So the Copilot product was a, a product originally of GitHub and now Microsoft because Microsoft owns GitHub, which is essentially like sentence completion, but when you're writing code. And, and makes writing software a lot more efficient. And given the fact that every company is a software company means that every company has the opportunity to get much more efficient and accurate by leveraging generative AI for you know, either the core software engineering of their company. So that's an example of increasing efficiency by leveraging generative AI. It could be useful for companies where ideating is a bottleneck, where you want to come up with new ideas. And so Gen AI can be useful for suggesting new ideas. In general, I think there's ways to improve efficiency with Gen AI, that said, that's just a special case of the ways that you can improve efficiency with software, right? And machine learning in particular. So as I said earlier, like, I'm glad that Gen AI is drawing a lot of people's attention to the wider continent of how to make sense of the world through data, because there's so many ways to make sense of the world through data and to understand complex problems better through data. So that's sort of my thinking about, about Gen AI. And how do you believe AI and data science will evolve over the next sort of five, 10, 15, even 20 years? I mean, a, a lot of it has been making things that people don't like doing easier to do so they don't have to do them. So, and that's arguably as old as compilers. You know, the idea that you don't need to plug wires into a machine to make it do a computation or you don't need to speak assembly language, right? Like those are all things, those are all examples where technology has like a tedious part and then that tedious part goes away, becomes abstracted. When I started at the New York Times, if you wanted to get your hands on data, you, what you really needed to do was write your own Java map reduced jobs against buckets of unstructured JSON and S3. So it was not a happy time. Now <laughs> everybody's able to write SQL and they're, they're using BigQuery and there's fast, reliable SQL access. So on the back end, 
there's a bunch of MapReduce jobs happening that nobody even says that word anymore, although it was a big topic in, in big data 15 years ago. So that's an example of how something that was really important and was a differentiator and allowed you to do things that you weren't capable of doing before becomes commoditized, right? Or like cloud computing. That's an example of something that just becomes a commodity. We don't think about it. So similarly, I was mentioning writing code. So writing code with Gen AI is, is, is much more efficient and I don't have to remember the details of syntax of curly bracket goes here, square bracket goes there, that kind of thing. That's going to cost me a bunch of time looking up. It's getting a lot more efficient to, to be a designer. And here by designer, I don't mean drawing pictures. I mean, somebody who solves a problem within a set of constraints. A data scientist is a designer, right? They're designing different types of algorithms and models. They iterate on those designs with their partners or based on the results of their previous analyses. All those things, I think, have the room to get more efficient by using better tooling. And Gen AI, particularly for coding, is, is one of those that I think is, is really, people are going to, I mean, the people who want to stay ahead are going to be using whatever the latest technology is, whether that's cloud computing or the spell checker or copilot or some other copilot equivalent. Those are all ways to do your job more efficiently and start thinking about the things that AI still can't do, you know, like designing an algorithms, multi-stage reasoning working with somebody to co-create a solution and help people think about what their KPIs are. I mean, those are things that AI is not, AI is not doing yet. And whatever the thing is that AI is not doing yet, I think people who are going to remain innovative are going to stay ahead of it by leveraging whatever commodity tooling is available to them on any given year. Do you have a view on how it impacts the labor force more broadly over the next, again, 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Yeah, it's hard to know. I mean, economists like to talk about things in terms of jobs and tasks, meaning or you might have a role, right? Like a job title. And that role is associated with a, a, a large number of tasks. And some of those tasks are going to be more easily automated than others. Economists often talk about how it's not that a role goes away because a role is rarely, a, a role is rarely one for which all of the tasks that contribute to that role are suddenly automatable at the same time. What more happens is, and again, here I'm preaching the gospel of economists outside my field, but a role generally involves many of those tasks. And at any given point, one of those tasks might become automatable and no longer needed, but your role might change, right? Your role might be doing different tasks in order to get that job done, right? I do think it's going to impact labor by changing the tasks that people do. It's it's still early days, right? We're, we're still actually really in the early phases of the implementation phase and the deployment phase. So I think it's still a little early to predict exactly how it's going to impact different jobs. And also, I should say, that's not just a tech problem, right? That's norms, laws, markets, and architecture, to quote the legal scholar Larry Lessig. Right? The architecture change is making LLMs. We still need to have a market change, which is the development of markets that are going to leverage this technology. There's changes in laws as these things become regulated. And there's changes in our norms, just depending on people. Do people feel comfortable having any piece of technology as part of integrated into their process and, and their reality and the way they talk to each other and things like that. So I'd say it's early days for, for this particular architecture change. Yeah. My view after yesterday, again, watching these demos of uh, Thor, for example, is it, once, once we have massive advances in robotics, which no doubt will eventually come, they've been slow for various reasons. But if you combine robotics with, uh, with the LLM, like, for example, if I think of, you know, the service force, like you already have, you know, kiosks at, you know, McDonald's, for example, to order. I was in uh, Europe a few months ago and there was, you know, a kiosk at McDonald's to order. This has massive implications on certain elements of service labor. I give a robot with, the, with this fabulous, you know, chatty and voice day LLM. Anyway. No, I think you're, I think you're getting to a very interesting point because you're saying, Go on, yes. think about LLM and HCI, human computer interface. And the other thing is you just, what you just said actually had a difference between LLM and Gen AI. So for example, LLM is really useful as a technology for embedding complex data sets. So when I walk up to a, a I don't remember which restaurant you said, but if I walk up to some restaurant, it kiosk, doesn't matter. I walk up to it and I say in whatever language I'm in the thing that I want to order and it becomes transcribed and becomes an order automatically. And then I just need to say confirm, or I just wave my credit card next to it or something like that. No generative text happened anywhere, right? So that's LLM, but not Gen AI, so to speak. I think the other thing about it is HCI, meaning the advances there are not just in the LLM and the AI, but in the human computer interface. So 
you know, somebody needs to build an interface that's good enough that you would want to use it in business and that people would expect it. That in turn speaks to markets and norms, right? Markets in that somebody had to invest a lot of capital in order to build out that product and norms in that, you know, different countries might have people who are more or less comfortable walking up to a box and saying to the box what their particular order is. And people may just not like that. And so all of these things have their own time scales, right? It's, it, the predicting the future is not just about predicting the tech changes or the continuation of the scaling law. It also involves our norms, our markets, and also our laws, right? I mean, some of these things have regulatory impact. Totally. You get it. You, you did a better job elucidating what I was tra- alluding to, which is the impacts can be massive. I mean, for example, if I think of the service levels post-pandemic, at least in my experience, they're generally lower than pre-pandemic. And if if you could have something like that, it has massive implications. So I like the way you, t- you tied that together. Any any advice um, allocators defined as, you know, people who are running sovereign wealth funds, pensions, endowments, foundations, family offices, or managers defined as a hedge fund or a long only or investment managers? Yeah, it depends on the time scale in which you're investing. So there's a lot of ways in the short term for people to leverage technology, which is rapidly being advanced by only a few hyperscalers and build features on top of it. That's a risk though, because it's very difficult for you to do something that the hyperscalers can also do better than you when they eventually realize that that's a market. And so as a short-term investor, maybe that's good. Maybe that you'll, you'll build something really good that'll get acquired, or it could be really bad. Maybe you'll build something that will be you know, replaced by 100x by one of the hyperscalers. So that's one type of advice for investors. The other, of course, is in a gold rush. In a gold rush, it's often a good idea to sell shovels or pickaxes. All of these things have requirements, data, people who train it, data centers, various infrastructure that you need. And so as companies want to leverage this, what are the infrastructures that these companies need in order to leverage it? And are those opportunities for new economic sectors for people effectively to be selling pickaxes in a gold rush? So it's not necessarily that everybody needs to be looking for the gold. Everybody needs to be thinking about, well, what are the people who are looking for gold going to need? And how do we build a, a new vertical around that? So I think that might be a better long-term strategy for investors personally than the short-term strategy of building new features on top of the eye popping tech du jour. Given that, there kind of is a moat, right? I, and I here I'm referencing a Google memo from years ago saying there is no moat around LLMs. Kind of is because the nature of the scaling laws is you actually need a lot of infrastructure to train a huge artificial general intelligence LLM. Now, if you want a more focused LLM, Lots of research has shown that you can build an LLM fast and cheap on a small vocabulary that's very focused and high quality if you want it to do one particular job. But if you want something that's able to talk to you about everything from Python to Plato, turns out you need to actually really have a lot of infrastructure and there's not that many companies or countries that are able to invest that much money to build the general solution. Right. Though I get your point on narrow versus broad, but I would... I mean, to some extent, I would think, you know, it's it's like if, if you think of Ted's book, have you read Ted's book on silos? Okay, anyway, it's like the, there also there's also a book I read, I can't think of the author, Specialists versus Generalists. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you need specialists in a complex world, but at the same time, if you get too siloed or specialized, you miss connecting the dots. So you have to, my point, or my point is, to your point, if you have narrow LLMs versus broad LLMs, the narrow can be very good at one thing, but you're going to, again, you're going to miss that, the the benefits of connecting the dots. And you have to be careful that you don't suffer from the silo effect is, was my point. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I was going to say, there is a computer science analog of that, which is explore and exploit in any world, particularly a changing world. You have to interact with the world and you have to try different things and you have to know when is the right time to try new things. And when is the right time to double down on something that looks like it's working now? So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, and then that's no different than when I was a portfolio manager at Soros for George Scott and Stan, and, and, or I would say Steve Cohn at Point72, or, you know, all the best traders slash investors in the world, they know when to double down. And, and in fact, that's how, you know, with George's famous Bank of England trade and with Stan and Scott, actually. And, you know, in other words, knowing when to double down and, as, as they would say, go for the jugular versus when to cut your losses and move on. So there's a similarity there to investing as well. Very much. What's a book you've read lately that that you think is interesting that that we should be reading? Well, 
let's see, I may have recency bias, but the topic of explore and exploit shows up a lot in a book called Algorithms to Live By, which people might enjoy. I hate to be that guy, but your question about data science advice, you might want to look at my book on data science in context, which is a book for data science practitioners, which I think would be useful. Mm -hmm. Actually, for understanding the long arc of artificial intelligence, I might recommend my other book, this book called How Data Happened, which I co-authored with a history professor about among other things, how AI came to be born, how AI came to be conceptualized and then reconceptualized many times over and eventually integrated into business in the form mostly of data science and the role of machine learning and all of that. So we try to take a historical arc that makes clear how notions like statistics and AI and data science and machine learning all fit together into our present reality. Those are three. Those are pretty good places to start for I, I agree. field. Yeah. I, I agree. That's perfect. And and your books are definitely worth reading. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Anything I should have asked you or discussed with you that, that you think is poignant and, and relevant and that either you're discussing with others now or that, that, that we missed? I would say between, well, maybe between those three books, there's a, there's a lot of material there. I do think a historical arc is useful for trying to keep things in context. You know, all of us are at different points in the hype cycle at the same time. Some people are just discovering what these technologies can do, and they're sort of irrationally exuberant. Some people have tried to use one of these technologies to do something, and it didn't work, and they're in the trough of despair. And it's, it's the best place to be is sort of the efficient part of the hype cycle, where we all are rationally exuberant about what technology can and cannot do. And, uh, and that's hard to do because the technology is changing real fast, which is exciting. And also because everybody's at a different point in the hype cycle. So when you're talking to somebody else, they may have a different conception of what these technologies can and still cannot do. I think a, taking a historical view is useful for particularly in really exciting moments where it seems like everything is changing real fast. I think taking a historical view is useful to see in ways that we've been here before and how this fits into a much longer arc. I think that's great advice. You're such an expert, but you you know, and and I know about the 75 plus, 75 ish year history of, of AI and machine learning in the nuclear winters and the booms bus. Mm -hmm. And again, I was at Soros during the first tech bubble. And, you know, so we, we have context, you know, and I've seen that bubble pop. And I think right now we're in, you know, we are and we aren't in an AI bubble. The AI, you know, it's real. The, again, the confluence of machine learning working, data science, exponential growth in data and record load processing and storage costs will. It, it, you know, has facilitated LLMs and, and all this, and there will be this, this, the, there is already this leg up, but, you know, the hype, there's also the hype cycle to your point, and there will be the disappointment in terms of people overestimating the certain things and or overfunding, for example, in VC, yeah. like to me, the VC is largely washed out post 2021, you know, but post, post a couple of years ago, but except in AI, where now it's, you know, and, and similarly, like with, I think there are plenty of equities, which are also overhyped and will implode or, or just overvalued because of the AI hype. Yeah. The fall of 2022 was exciting for a couple of reasons in VC. One was the launch of ChatGPT, which sort of drew a lot of investors' attention to AI or a particular small corner of AI, I should say. The other was the decline of cryptocurrency, right? And those sorts of things happened at the same time. Suddenly there's a bunch of people who for whom tech investment pivoted from looking at crypto to looking at AI. I, I think it'll be one for the history books to see how much capital, you know, didn't go away, but was rather deployed in a different direction very suddenly. Yeah, totally. I couldn't agree more. All right. On that note, Chris, we'd like to thank you for the interesting discussion, sharing your most valuable asset with us, your time. We hope listeners have a better appreciation for, for what one of the, the world's preeminent data scientists and thought leaders in data science and AI is, is thinking about and how we can all benefit from it. This is your host, Michael Oliver Weinberg, hoping you'll join us again for our next episode where we speak with another thought leader who will provide insight into improving alpha via innovation. Thank you for joining us on the Improving Alpha Innovation in Investing ESG and Technology podcast presented in partnership with Vidrio Financial and sponsored by Alternatives Watch, thefundmarketer.com and PEVC Tech. Vidrio Financial offers a cutting edge data management solution that not only collects and cleans your data, but also empowers investment teams to cut through the noise and extract valuable insights for better decision making in areas such as valuation, risk assessment and portfolio management. 
If you're an endowment, foundation, pension, sovereign wealth fund, asset manager, OCIO or family office facing challenges with your data pipelines, we invite you to connect with us today and explore how Vidrio can seamlessly integrate with your investment team to enhance your data management capabilities. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Vidrio Financial or our host, Michael Oliver Weinberg. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding investment planning.